Thank you all for coming. I don't recognize any of you, nor can I recall why I'm here. Now, without further ado, my name is Aaron Powell, and this is Docker from Scratch. Uh, there's some contact details and stuff if you want to find me afterwards or follow me on Twitter or anything like that. Uh, I'll also be around the Redify booth um, just around the corner for most of the day if you want to come and have a chat uh, after this talk. So obviously, this is a talk about Docker. When we talk about Docker, we talk about a whole bunch of different things. We talk about things like immutable infrastructure or you know, doing containerized architectures using microservices and deploying them into to cloud infrastructure using Kubernetes or DCOS or Swarm. Uh, we, we talk about how we can use Docker to make our development environment almost identical to our product and production environment, how we, you know, we, we build this stuff and we ship it and nothing changes as we roll across uh, all the different environments that we're using within our application. We have no rollback. We always roll forward and all that kind of stuff. This is not a talk about that part of Docker. We are not going to be covering off things like Kubernetes or anything like that. This is a talk about the basics. This is a talk targeted at people that, I mean, Docker's been something that they've wanted to learn, but have just never found the time. Or it's something that you've heard about, but you don't even know what its, uh, what its concepts are, how to use it, or like, what value it could bring into what you're building as applications or anything like that. This is a talk where we're going to start from scratch. And throughout the course of this talk, we'll understand what I mean why, and why I'm putting the emphasis, emphasis on from scratch. So there's a bunch of other Docker content that will cover off all the stuff that I showed in the previous slides. There are things about you know, um, you know, doing clustered architecture in production and all that kind of stuff. So kind of this could be a entry point to you know, maybe I want to go and learn some more about that afterwards. Hopefully, that's what you take away from this talk. But like I said, this is, a, this is intended to help you get started with Docker and, and kind of talk about my experience when I first was getting into Docker and uh, working out where to go from there. So I want to just start with some useful terminology so that we understand a bit about what Docker is and, and some of the uh, concepts that I'm going to introduce over the course of this talk so that we can understand them in the context of what we're going to be doing. So first off, I w just want to clarify, Docker is not a virtual machine. Uh, Docker is about isolation. It's, uh, it's come from like, Linux and U the Unix world, uh, a concept called chroot, um, which is basically creating user space isolation with inside of the kernel. So you are almost running something that is a, a, a full-blown uh, Linux kernel. Uh, with inside of it, but it's still separate from uh, the other processes that are running it. It's often thought about almost like process isolation as well. A bit of terminology that I'm going to use a lot is uh, the idea of an image. An image is your starting point when bu building something from Docker. An image is used to baseline a bunch of reproducible output. Uh, Thinking about it from, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a developer from, uh, well, that's my background. I, I'm not an ops person, so I think of things in developer context. And when I think about an image, uh, from an OO programming perspective, an image is a class definition. From that, we then have containers. A container is a running image. It's made from some kind of image that we started with. So it's the implementation of a class. It's an object created from a class, again, using an OO programming analogy there. Um, oftentimes, when, uh, when I was first getting started with Docker or when I'm talking to people about Docker, uh, they'll often confuse the, the idea of an image and a container and they think that the words are used, used interchangeably, uh, but they're, they're not. They're, they're very different concepts and we'll see how that happens uh, and, and what the differences are as we uh, start doing some of the demos uh, shortly. And the final bit of terminology I want to talk about is the host. The host is the machine that is running Docker. Uh, I'm running a Windows laptop. I'm going to be using Linux Docker containers. Uh, so that kind of works a, a little bit differently than if I was running a, a native Linux laptop. Um, uh, I'm not going to be talking about Windows containers. I think there's some other content throughout the week if you're interested in Windows containers, uh, because there's uh, some fundamental differences between Linux and Windows containers. But basically, uh, the crux of it is uh, the host is the machine that Docker is installed on. For all intent and purpose, Docker is installed on my Windows machine, and I'm going to be working with Linux. How that works, um, you know, I can chat to you afterwards if you want to understand some of the, the nitty gritty internals, but I won't dive too much into that. So we tend to interact with Docker from a command line. Uh, this is a standard command that you might be running with Docker. Uh, so it's made up of the Docker CLI tool that we work with. Um, 
We then provide that with a command that we're going to execute against Docker. In this case, it's a run command. We have some options that we pass to run, uh, a dash IT flag and a dash dash RM. And I'll talk about what those do uh, throughout the demos that we do in a moment. We then have some arguments we pass to the command. This is actually, there's two arguments here. The first is the image that we're going to be using. So that's Ubuntu. And then uh, some kind of an execution, uh, executable to run with inside of the Ubuntu container. And in this case, it's going to be slash bin slash bash. OK, so that's enough time spent in PowerPoint. We're going to spend pretty much the rest of the talk at a command line as I go through live demos. And we're going to cross our fingers and hope that none of my live demos fail. Um, I gave this talk a couple of days ago, and I got through most of them without any failures. But you know, today's a new day. So let's see how, how kind the demo gods are going to be to me today. I'm going to start with the canonical Hello World example of Docker. So I've got that command. Uh, whoops, I probably should close my slides so that everyone actually can see my command line. Okay, okay so I've got a command here uh, that I'm going to execute, pretty much similar to the one that we had with inside of the PowerPoint slides just a moment ago. Now, using Docker run, uh, I'm passing in a flag, dash IT. This flag, or this argument that I'm passing to run is to say that I want an interactive Docker container started. So this allows me to then connect to std in, essentially, and I can type and interact with that container as it's been run. Uh, then we're starting with the Ubuntu image and executing uh, the command bin bash. So let's run that. So here we go. I've been dropped into uh, what looks like a Unix prompt. I can run Unix commands such as ls. And you see here, I've got a file system, a very Unix-looking file system. Uh, uh, now, I'm, because now I am running inside of an Ubuntu image, I can uh, make directory uh, call it foo. So I can then you know, create something that uh, sits at the root of this file system, a folder called foo, and so on and so forth. So my container is up and running. I can you know, do a whole bunch of stuff with that, and I can you know, see what it, uh, uh, play around with uh, a Linux machine running on my Windows box. I can also run a command, and I'll just do this from another, another shell, uh, called ps, which this lists the containers that are running on my machine. So you can see I've got a container here. Uh, it's got a container ID of 49FE00A, and so on and so forth. Uh, it started from an Ubuntu image. Uh, it had a command. It was created 47 seconds ago. It was still up 45 seconds ago. Um, it's got a name of Loving Benz. Um, Obviously, I've got this zoomed a little bit, so it wouldn't normally wrap, but you know, for the sake of readability, particularly for the people at the back, I've um, increased the font size a touch. But you know, it would normally format it a little bit better. So uh, there's, there's my running container. Uh, I can see it and find some basic information about it. I can exit that container, drop back to my command line, come over here and dock a PS again. That container's been stopped. It's not running anymore because I, sent a, uh, I, I exited the application that the container was running. So it shut down, because it's running just a single process until, it until that process is told to not run any longer. I can still see that container by running uh, docker ps a, uh, or expand that to double dash all. So this lists all containers, uh, regardless of their status on the machine. ps just lists the, the current uh, running, images, uh, running containers, whereas this is listing all uh, containers started and stopped. So you can see here I have one. Uh, it was exited 19 seconds ago. Uh, now, I could say docker. And if I wanted to do something with that container, let's say I want to restart it. I can do docker start. And then I need to provide it some kind of unique identifier for that container that I want to start. In this case, I want to start container ID 49F, et cetera, et cetera. But because I only have to provide enough uniqueness that Docker can work out the rest for me, I can give it just four. I can give it four nine. I tend to just use two characters um, because that tends to be as much uniqueness as you necessarily need. Uh, I can also use the name Loving Benz if I wanted to as well. So I can start that, docker ps, and we can see that it was up one second ago. I can then attach to it. And I'm back on there, ls, and we see that file system that we saw before. You can see that the foo folder is still there and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if I was to do docker stop 49, I can then send a stop command to that running container, which can be coming back over to this terminal. See, that's containers exited. I'm back at my PowerShell prompt instead of being in my, um, my bash prompt that I was uh, before. So uh, 
what that essentially has done is it sent, um, it sent a, a, an exit signal across to the running container, which is then told the process that's running in that container to exit, and it will gracefully shut down. Uh, the final thing, I'm just going to remove that container, so docker rm. Just do some cleanup, remove 49. Now if I do docker ps, I have nothing left in my container list, either running or stopped. OK. So that's, like I said, a canonical, a canonical Hello World example. Let's go to something else. All right, so this is where we start to see the difference between an image and a container. And it, because an image is our starting point, I can make multiple containers based off of the same image. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm creating three different Ubuntu containers, but they're all based off of the same Ubuntu image. I've added a couple of additional flags, uh, dash D, which starts this container in a detached mode. So while it is still dash, da, uh, dash IT, so it's still interactive, it's detached, which means that my terminal is not immediately connected to it. I have to use Docker attach to then attach that, con uh, that container later on. Passing in the dash dash RM flag, which basically means that when this container stops, remove yourself. Uh, this is really useful when you're doing prototyping or demos like this and stuff like that. I, I want to start up a bunch of containers, but I don't want them sitting around like that. That's space on disk that I don't need, uh, particularly if I'm just testing something out or prototyping typing something. I just want it to, to go away when I'm done. I'm also doing dash dash name, which is giving this a, I'm specifying the name. So instead of getting a uniquely generated name, like loving underscore Benz, uh, I'm saying that these uh, are named Ubuntu 1 through 3. So let's run that. So starting up the multiple containers, and you'll see that it's output the, um, the IDs of each of those containers that have been run. Um, and now I can go over and attach them. So I'm just going to open up a couple more PowerShell terminals. Just resize them a touch. OK, so if we do docker attach Ubuntu 1, docker attach Ubuntu 2, and then I bet you can guess what I'm attaching to here. If I can type correctly, OK, whoops. Uh, it entered properly on all of them. OK, cool. Now I'm inside of all three of these. Uh, let's take number one and just make directory of foo at the root. We ls on that one and then say go to number two. Well, they, uh, they, they started with the same looking file system. They're, because they're all isolated, they're, they don't know about each other. They can't talk to each other. Um, they, they don't share a file system. Anything I do on the file system of one container is not available to the file system of another container. So yeah, I've obviously added a folder to one, but it's not available anywhere else. So I, I have that isolation of process. So the, this batch process is isolated per container. Uh, if I was to say docker stop Ubuntu 2, we'll stop that one. Uh, my middle PowerShell terminal has dropped back to just the PowerShell prompt. And if we do uh, process list all, uh, you'll see that I only have Ubuntu 1 and 3 running because the because uh, it had the dash dash rm flag, it cleaned itself up when it stopped. Cool, and uh, let's just exit the others. I don't need them open for um, any longer. We've killed everything that we needed. All right, so let's just clean everything up a little bit. Wait till focus comes in, and let's go to our next demo. All right. So I said that the file systems are isolated, so I, can't, I don't know what happens in Ubuntu 1 in Ubuntu 2. I don't have any way to interact between them. But what if I did want to have something that's shared between them? Uh, uh, the, these are transient so far that if I, I kill them, I remove them, I don't have any of the files that was created within them. I've got no way to get those files back out. And this is where I want to introduce the concept of Docker volumes. Now you see a new argument that I've included here, dash v. Uh, dash v is short for dash dash volume. And um, what that does is it creates a mount point between the host that the container has been run from and the container itself. So it takes an argument that's um, got two parts to it. One, which is the directory of the local container, uh, the directory on the host that you want to mount. And then what is the folder on the container that you want to mount that to? So because I'm running this in a, uh, a batch file, uh, I'm mounting um, the current working directory, percent cd percent, and I'm going to mount that to a directory called slash files. Now, this one uh, it also introduces uh, something that I tend to use Docker for, uh, and that is like, executing a single process that I maybe don't want to have on my actual machine. Uh, I treat my laptop as a very transient device. If it dies, I'll take it to the Microsoft store and go, it's dead. And hopefully, they'll give me a new one. It doesn't necessarily work that way, but that's at least the hope. 
so I don't tend to install a whole lot of software on my machine. Um, I'll have some you know, core tools that I, I use day to day, but you know, I had a scenario uh, the other month where uh, I was doing a technical interview at Redify and someone had sent me a RAW file of uh, a coding exercise that we get candidates to do. It's a, a RAW file. I was like, I checked my watch. It was still 2017. I hadn't gone back to 2005 and had not paid for a WinRAR license still. Uh, I was like, as an archiving format, I don't remember the last time I like, used RAR in the wild. I had a similar instance with 7-zip, so like, that one was even more obscure. Like, I, so I don't have anything on my machine that can unra that. Well, OK, so what's, what would someone normally do? They'd go and download 7-zip, but not me. I, I, I'm going to use this once, so I'm going to find a Docker image that does it. I don't actually, like, I don't need 7-zip long term. I just, I want to be able to run a process, terminate, and it's gone away, and I don't need it anymore. So I found a, uh, a Docker image out there, uh, max c n something something slash uh, unra. So this uses the, the Unix unra command, and I mount a volume of my machine, and then I tell it to unra that particular file. So let's... Just run that. Uh, so this is not the code that the candidate sent me. I was not going to show that uh, from a privacy standpoint. I did not want to share that uh, at NDC. This is something I found in my inbox. Um, from a, there's a, a raw file of something from Codeplex from 2010, I think. So it's some really old code. Um, OK, cool. Uh, oh, hang on. I need to, need to delete it from when I ran the demo earlier today and just made sure everything still worked. OK, so let's just try again. So here we go. It's unrarring a whole bunch of um, you know, .NET code, uh, dropping that to disk. And then I have here a trunk folder, which is then the contents of that RAR file. I mean, you'll have to obviously trust me that that's the contents of that RAR file. But you, you can see the output window um, did that. Uh, there we go. That, that's how you can use Docker for just like a, a single run process. You know, something you just want to prototype with or something you want to play around with. You don't want to have to go through the whole effort of you know, installing three versions of Java because you want to test across three different Java runtimes. You can just pull down a Docker container of each of the different versions and test an application against those. So speaking of Java, let's go on to our next demo. So this is not Java. This is Node. <laughs> um, uh, there's that many versions of Node, and it, uh, every other week there, there's either a preview build or there's a new long-term service build that's out or something like that. So if you're building something on Node and uh, maybe you're building like a, a, a redistributable package and something you're publishing in open source, how do you effectively make sure that that works across quite a large variety of uh, Node versions? Well, the easiest way is pull down a Docker image that has uh, of all the different versions that you want to test with, make a container from that, Run your test inside of it, see if it passes. There we go. Uh, rather than uh, you know, having to install something like NVM and manage multiple local installs of Node and stuff like that, you can quite easily use a Docker image for that. So we run this, it starts up, and we have console.log, hello, NDC. So I'm inside of the Node.js REPL, because that's where I've been dropped by running this, um, this command. Uh, you'll notice uh, that I didn't have a argument past uh, the node colon uh, version number uh, because I just want to execute whatever the default command that that image would run when a container is created from that. In this case, it's just going to execute node.exe. Well, sorry, it's not going to execute node.exe. It's going to just execute node. It's node.exe. It's Unix. Um, so I end up inside of the node REPL. So I can do like const fs and then pull in like node modules uh, if I... Hey, there's another demo failure. Excellent. Um, and then do like fs read directory of slash, and then errors, paths, paths. So if we just log all of that out, uh, we realize that I've fat fingered something else. And uh, yeah, it's paths. I, Call the variable path, and then I call paths when I try and output it. So, but there we go. So that's like in, inside of then a Docker container. So I can use Node to inspect that, and you can see that it's still a Unix file system. At the at the end of the day, I can see all the same stuff there. So I can traverse it. Um, that's good for you know, interacting with a particular single process. And this is obviously a single process that's running with inside of 
uh, my container. Uh, I don't have like, kind of the ability to do anything else with it. Cool. So let's jump out of that, clear it off, and we'll go on to number five. OK, so this time I want to do something. Uh, I want to actually run an application with inside of a node uh, with inside of a container. So I've got an application here. Um, I'm not going to go into the details about how this node app works. Um, I don't want this to become a node talk. I, I appreciate that this is probably you know, a fairly complex node application. So I don't, want to, I don't want to dwell on how node works or anything like that. But the crux of it is it's going to be a web server. So just, just trust me that that's a web server in node. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to start up a server. I'm going to bind that to port 3000. Uh, and then I want to be able to obviously get a response from that. OK. So we'll run. Oh, sorry. I'll just go back. Uh, so we're using volume mounting again. Uh, you'll see you know, we're mounting the source uh, into a slash src directory. I'm also then running another command, dash, another argument, dash w, which sets the working directory for the process that's being executed to slash src, so the, where I've mounted to. Uh, the, got the image then, and then I'm saying, you're going to execute, instead of just dropping you at the node REPL, I want to execute a particular node, uh, a particular file using the node.js uh, application. So I'm going to execute node and app.js. Now, if I didn't do, uh, so it knows where that file is because of the slash w, uh, the dash w flag. If I didn't do that, I could do like slash src slash app.js, and it would uh, do exactly the same thing. OK, cool. So we'll start that up, uh, run that in detach mode. So the, the server is up and running, um, and I can uh, uh, docker ps, see that, yeah, cool, there we go. It's up and running. All right, so let's go curl, localhost, localhost, 3000. Wah, wah, wah. We've got an error. It hasn't been able to resolve, or it couldn't connect to the server. Well, but hang on a sec, I, I said, like, I, I didn't fat finger that right. Like, I said it was port 3000 if we go back to app.js. Yep, it's supposed to be listening on port 3000. OK. Um, maybe there's something in the logs. So docker logs node. Server's up and running. If I tell it to follow the logs, well, the, it's, the, like, the process is definitely running because it's still trying to write logs out. OK, well, uh, let's just go curl again. Local host 3000. Well, didn't crash the process. Like, there's nothing in my logs that says it's crashed. Well, what's gone wrong? Well, I know what's gone wrong, because I wrote these demos, right? <laughs> uh, so what's happened is the process is running. It's listening on that port. But I haven't told it to actually map inbound connections to that port. So let's have a look at the information about this container. So I can use node inspect and then provide it with uh, an ID for a container. So I've inspected the node container that we've got running. And there is a network section here. And here in lies the problem. The container itself has not got any ports mapped to it. The container itself is running. The, container, uh, the application inside of the container is listening on that port. But the container doesn't have any ports bound to its host. OK, cool. So we'll just uh, stop the node container. We'll come back over here. That'll exit in a moment. So this, uh, so this is where um, stop is useful, because uh, it's sending a because it's sending the shutdown command to that process. Um, it's not doing like a hard stop. It's not just you know, uh, doing like a, a kill dash, uh, dash F or anything on that. It's sending the proper sig term processes, uh, commands across to the process. So it will shut down gracefully. So if you do have an application running, it will then do all the proper cleanup. You know, if it's got to you know, release database connections and stuff like that, it can do all of that cleanup nicely before it shuts down. It's not just you've pulled the power from me. OK, so let's go to step six. OK. And we'll come back to our run. And now we have a dash p flag. So the dash p is that we're going to do port binding. 
So Dash P is port. Uh, you can have as many Dash P's as you want with inside of it. And you can, so you can bind multiple ports to a container. So the process can list on, listen on multiple ports. This could be useful if you're running something like uh, RabbitMQ is a good example of this. It has the management port and it has the, um, the Q listening port. So you, you could bind two ports on that. Uh, and the, the port bindings, kind of similar to the way that we do volume mounting, is something on the host colon something on the container. So in this case, I can map whatever port I want on my host to port 3000 on the container. And to illustrate this, I've mapped port 8080 on my host through to port 3000 on the container. So I'll run that again. And we can pop that up. Uh, it's clear. And if we curl local, local host. Man, you think I'd be better at writing local host by now? Like how many years I've been writing that out? Uh, so if I now call on 8080, excellent, there we go. Uh, we've got our hello world back as we expected. Uh, 3000 will still send back that error that we, you know, again, that we would expect because we're not binding anything to port 3000 on my host. It's not being able to do any, um, any redirections across to a container. So if we go back and say docker inspect node, so just go back and have a look at what our network settings now look like, you see that ports is, um, the array of ports has been fleshed out a bit. Uh, we have port 3000 on TCP. So you can map both UDP and TCP ports into a Docker container. Um, obviously, I'm only doing TCP in this case. Uh, what IP on the host? So if you've got like multiple um, NICs with inside of the host that you're running Docker on, you can map incoming requests on one particular NIC across to uh, a particular container, um, if so desired. Uh, we say, so that's what the host IP is all about. And then the host port is what port on my machine. So yeah, like I said, you can map whatever port you want locally across to whatever port you want on your server. So you can have everything listening on port uh, 80 with inside of Docker containers, but on local dev or in, uh, inside of your production system before your reverse proxy, they're all running on like random ports and stuff like that. Uh, now, when you do port binding, you don't have to do the uh, the host port colon syntax, you can just do, uh, I want to bind like port 3000. What it'll do is it'll randomly choose a port uh, on your machine and then you're gonna have to go into Docker uh, inspect and find out what that port is and stuff like that. Just a bit annoying. Uh, also we can do Docker PS uh, and we'll see the port information uh, across on the far right hand side of that, the left hand side of that. Right. Wait, it's backwards to me. Anyway, you get my point. <laughs> uh, and we can also see there all the different ports that we've got bound. Okay, so let's just stop node again, and we're gonna jump over to our next demo. All right, so our command that we're getting was, it was starting to get a little bit big to run our node application, right? We, we had to volume map, we had to specify ports, we set working directories, um, like a whole bunch of stuff we, like we're having to set. And if I wanna get you know, a colleague on my team to just, hey, check out this like little node app that I've written, uh, I, it just, it's really useful just parsing out your, um, uh, downloading all your payslips from your, um, when you're transitioning between payroll systems, which is something we're, we're actually doing at Redify at the moment. Uh, to, you know, having to send around this like massive command line argument set that you gotta do, you know, somebody's gonna fat finger that at some point, and it's like, and then I get the call and it's like, hey, uh, your command doesn't work, it's like, oh. Okay, so how do we make that a bit more reproducible? Well, we can start building our own images to do that. And this is where I wanna introduce another file called Dockerfile. Uh, so a Dockerfile is an instruction set, it's a DSL of how to create an image uh, in Docker. And it's, uh, we then use that to basically execute a bunch of commands that we can then create an image that we can then run as a container later on. So we always start with a from command inside of our Docker file, because our Docker image that we're creating has to start from something else. And think about it. the title from scratch. Uh, that's what the, uh, that was the joke, yeah. Um, so in this one, this, this image I'm doing uh, from node 774, uh, particular uh, build of that. I'm saying that this image exposes port 3000. So that's just telling people that are gonna be starting this as a container later on that uh, they know that they're gonna to need to do some port mapping um, should they so desire. If they cannot do port mapping, it's just not gonna be a very useful application. Uh, I'm gonna run a command on that image which is gonna make a directory called slash src. 
And instead of doing volume mounting, so they, um, the person doesn't have to volume mount that on their machine, and I don't have to ship them the app.js file, I'm actually going to execute the copy command, which will then copy the file from my machine into the image. Uh, it's copying it into the slash src folder. And then set the working directory as slash src, and then cmd, no, oh, excuse me, is the command that the container will execute when it starts up. So it's going to execute node app.js. Now this time, instead of just, like, I can't just use docker run because I'm trying to create an image here, right? Uh, and docker run is all about running containers from an image. So to do that, first I need to build an image from my docker file. So this is where we use the docker build command. Docker build dash t, so I'm going to tag that image with something that I can understand rather than just like, dealing with the, the massive image ID that I would normally get, uh, that I would get generated. I'm going to tag this as my Node.js app. I have to tell it where to find the Docker file. So I'm just saying dot current directory. Uh, if I, uh, so by convention, it will look for a file named Docker file. Uh, you can change that file name to whatever you want, uh, but then you have to specify another argument that is the name of the Docker file within inside of a working, uh, within inside of a particular directory. By convention, Docker file is just a, like, is what people would be using. So on line five, we build an image, and then on line seven, we're going to do Docker run, uh, immediately remove on shutdown. Uh, we do our port binding, detach, and then the Node.js application. So we're going to start that image as a container. I'm not going to send any commands after that, because I would just want it to execute its default command. So we run that. So the first thing, uh, it's doing the build, and you'll see that it's going through each step that I've got in that Docker file. Uh, from a particular uh, base container. It'll pull that down if I don't already have it. Uh, it will execute expose so that that's um, put in there, so on and so forth. And now I have a built image at the end of the day, which I can then start as a container, which I have done, and that's uh, 8.6e, et cetera. So I can go back and execute my curl on local host 80. There we go. Uh, now, I can do Docker images. And I can list out all the images that I've got on my machine. So you see there at the top, I've got a new one called Node.js-app. Uh, it was created 33 seconds ago. It has a size of 59 megabytes, uh, because that's basically the size of, the size of a Node.js image um, uh, that I'm using here. And I've added a couple of K over the top of that, or maybe 1K over the top of that. Uh, and obviously, I've got a whole bunch of other images uh, already on my machine. Uh, so now I can I'll just do docker stop node. That will stop that container. Oh, wait, no, I didn't give it a name. There was eight. Uh, we'll stop that one, shut it down, and then I can remove that image if I don't want it on my machine anymore. Give it a sec, terminate process. Uh, if we do docker rmi, so we used rm to remove a container, rmi to remove an image, and this will be Node.js app. And we've deleted a whole bunch of um, uh, stuff that was inside of uh, on disk for me, so I freed up a bit of uh, disk space. Cool. So that's how we can create something that we can ship as a reusable, and that's where you can start seeing how you would build applications and you start sharing an application that's a containerized um, architecture around. Uh, it starts from you know, this Docker file is where where we really start with. All right. So on to our next demo. Uh, we still had a couple of command line arguments that we had to execute there, though. We still had to say that we, you know, we wanted to do some port bindings and so on and so forth. Uh, there's another way that we can start up a Docker container, and that is with Docker Compose. Docker Compose is really useful about how we can start describing an environment that we want to run using, uh, using Docker. So this, by convention, uses a file called docker-compose.yaml, or .yml. Uh, it uses the YAML syntax to create that. Uh, so I've got a very basic Docker um, Compose file here. It's got two components to it. It's got services and it's got networks. Services are the containers that you're going to start with inside of your Docker file. And then networks are uh, how we can do some isolation. I'm not going to dive too much in networks right now because we're going to see networks a bit later on. So uh, here we can predefine a bunch of stuff, though. I can predefine uh, my port binding. So I can say that port 8080 is going to bind onto port 3000. Uh, I can specify the, that when it's built, it's going to build and a particular Docker file that it's going to be built from. And this, uh, if I had multiple applications, I could start writing out multiple services with inside of here. Now, this time we're going to use a different command line tool, docker-compose. 
Compose is uh, it's, it's essentially a separate product within inside of the Docker family. Uh, so we uh, we have Docker Compose instead of Docker Space Compose. It's not a command on the Docker CLI. Uh, so on line five, I'm using Docker Compose, uh, specifying the file that I want to use as my Compose file, current working directory, Docker Compose YAML. And I'm going to say stand up that environment. Uh, but in particular, I want to stand up the node service within inside of that Compose file. So I've had multiple services. I could stand all of them up by just doing Docker Compose up. Uh, if I wanted to stand up one, I do Docker Compose and then the specific service name, which is what I'm doing here. Uh, line seven is uh, once that process is exited, I just want to do a Docker Compose cleanup. So Docker Compose RM, and I'm just doing a force RM, you know, kill everything with fire. So that's how you, how you would stand up and then clean up with uh, using Docker Compose. Oops. So if we run, now you'll see it's doing a, a few different things. It's creating, uh, it creates a network. It's creating that image again because I deleted that image in the last step um, of the last demo. Uh, so it's got to create that image from scratch. Ha! Huh. Uh, and then it's uh, started that um, container from that image. You will see right at the bottom, node underscore one, which is the name that has been assigned. Uh, it's up and running. And then uh, we can do, we can do our curl, but I, I won't do that demo again um, because we've seen it all run before. Uh, but you can see, yeah, there we go. Uh, you'll notice that the, the name uh, of both the image and the running container uh, have um, a prefix on them, and that's the current working directory. The, so Docker from scratch is my uh, current folder. So that's, that's how it's done that. You can use in the compose file, you can control the name, and we'll see that shortly. Uh, so just exit uh, the Node.js process. It's going to shut down. Uh, give it a second while that process is exiting. There we go. Oops. There we go. And then that's you know, done all of its cleanup again. All right. So on to more demos. All right. So, like I said, I tend not to install software on my machine uh, if I can help it. Uh, as a .NET developer, um, so it does a lot of ASP.NET um, web dev, there's one thing that you kind of can't get away with not installing, and that's SQL Server, until Docker. Uh, so I don't actually have SQL Server installed on my machine. Instead, I use SQL Server inside of a Docker container. <clears throat> and that's using the Linux implementation of Microsoft SQL Server from, from Microsoft. And I can quite easily start that up. Um, I'm going to use a com uh, Compose file again to do this. Uh, just because it simplifies some stuff. So, uh, binding port, so port 1433, which is the standard SQL Server port. Um, I'm creating a new network that I'm going to shove all of that stuff in there. The image is Microsoft slash MSSQL Linux, uh, Server Linux. Um, and then I have to provide some other stuff. I, you know, this is SQL Server. You've got to accept a license agreement. I'm probably going to want an SA password on that so I can connect to it and you know, be able to interact with it. Uh, so, we use environment variables here. And that's what that new section in the compose file is for. Uh, we have an environment section, and these are environment variables that are going to be inside of that container. So inside of that container, if I was to uh, echo env, um, I would see except underscore eula is y, and we would see my super strong SA password. So if we were to run that. So this time using Docker Compose, I'm actually not building a new image. I'm just running the, uh, the baseline SQL Server image. Uh, there we go. It's uh, it's crashed for some lovely reason that is deep with inside of SQL Server. Uh, awesome. Um, you can trust me that that would normally work. Uh, so, yeah. um, what I'm not doing here is I'm not doing any kind of volume mounting or anything like that. Uh, if you if you are running a database, be it a SQL Server or Mongo or any kind of anything with persistent storage, you're probably going to want to volume mount so that. Um, as the container is shut down, you don't lose all the data that's in your database or your, uh, your Redis cache or whatever it might be. Um, cool. Uh, I'm not going to try and debug why that's failed. Uh, I've got plenty of other demos that we can get onto anyway and hope that none of them also suffer the same fate because most of them require SQL Server. Okay. Uh, wait, where, where was I? Okay. So, 
I'm now, uh, I want to talk about how we can use the Compose to actually start representing our environment. That's what I said that is, uh, is one of the useful aspects of the Compose file, is that you can represent how your whole application architecture would look. So to do this, uh, I'm just going to stand up, I've got a, um, an ASP.NET Core application that runs inside of a Docker container. And I want to, this ASP.NET application, I want it to then talk to a SQL server. But because I don't have SQL Server installed, I'm going to rely on uh, on this. And I just realized I forgot to increase my font size in every, uh, increase it in everything but Visual Studio. So, uh, so uh, Visual Studio actually has pretty decent support for Docker. Uh, it does have some rough edges that I've hit a couple of times doing these demos. And fingers crossed that I don't get hit by them right now. Um, if they do, I'm going to have to quickly try and make them work. And we'll just do a little song and dance, and everyone you know, don't watch as things fail. Uh, but I've now got two services with inside of this uh, Compose file. I have the demo app, which is my ASP.NET Core application. Um, it's got a Docker file that it starts, uh, it bases itself off, uh, which tells it to use the ASP.NET Core 1.1 1, 1, um, Docker image, stuff like that. Uh, we're going to stand that up, and it's going to be up and running. Uh, and then SQL Server is also going to be stood up, uh, basically all the same information that we had previously. and. What I'm actually going to be doing is I'm going to be putting them on, uh, I've got multiple networks to find. Uh, so that's the other thing that I've got in here. You see at the bottom I've got two networks, um, one, web, one called web and one called DB. Because what I'm starting to do is uh, I'm defining my architecture that maybe my SQL server, that's not going to be publicly accessible. It's going to be on a network that's firewall blocked. Right? You can't access that from the public internet. So I'm putting this into a separate network to the web server. But the web server still needs to be able to talk to the SQL server. So they're also going to share a network. Um, and we'll see how we can do some fun stuff with network isolation uh, as we sort of explore these demos. But I'm going to start off by hitting F5 and watching to see whether or not Visual Studio is just going to do an operation error, uh, which is what it has been doing a couple of times on me through these demos. OK, so it's basically going through this Compose file. It's executing a bunch of stuff, uh, creating a couple of images, uh, it then has a compile error, which I've not hit before, and this is where I start crying a little to myself. Um, no, it's actually got a bunch of stuff hanging around from uh, earlier on. Uh, just make sure I have, so I have something up and running. I'm just going to kill, if you don't care about sending a, a nice exit code, you can kill dash F, uh, sorry, uh, I can not kill, uh, docker rm dash F. It's like, I just want this container to go away. Bam. That'll kill that. It, that doesn't send a nice shutdown to the process it's running. It's just like, bam, you're dead. Um, and that's then going to hopefully, uh, and then RM means that it's going to clean itself up. Uh, I just need to clean up some networks, I think. Yep. Work. Prune. Uh, yep, let's get rid of all the networks that I don't actually need. And now hopefully I'll be able to check what I've got in my images. I'm just going to remove the demo demo app image as well so that uh, dash I can forcibly remove an image uh, so if I try and remove an image that a container is running on it'll stop me if I dash F it's just kill I just <laughs> go like get rid of everything um, so that gets rid of that and then PSA uh, so I now actually have to actually right, have to kill these images docker uh, rm dash F of 31 50 5B and 16. And that is how we kill with fire anything that's running in Docker. <laughs> uh, just PS, make sure everything's gone, images, network. All right, cool. We are hopefully back to being in a position where I can hit F5 and not have Visual Studio complain at me. One of the fun things about doing live demos is that if you do actually want to practice, you've got to make sure that you really clean up after yourself. Uh, excellent. Uh, operation failed in Visual Studio. So uh, this is where we do the song and dance as my demos just completely fall apart. Um, I just have to go back and re-execute all those RMs again. RM-F, E5, and 13. Images. I of demo app dev and Docker network 
prune, oops, prune, yes. Alrighty, we are going to relaunch Visual Studio. Um, the Visual Studio Docker tooling, uh, it seems that, uh, I, and this I'm just going to like totally eat my words in about two minutes' time, uh, but it seems that uh, if, it, if, it, if you've got Visual Studio running, you've tried to execute a, execute a bunch of stuff in Docker, they have failed, it then sort of hangs around inside of Visual Studio and you can't re-kill it, which is really kind of frustrating. Uh, so you have to kind of close Visual Studio, kill everything, open Visual Studio, um, cross your fingers, hit F5 again, cry to yourself when it doesn't work and go, thank you for coming, um, see me outside and I might try and get it working at, at another point. Um, yeah, I, I actually, I, I hit that operation exception um, earlier today, so I, I'm getting quite good at recovering from that point. Uh, as, as you can see by the fact that I've been able to just talk through um, a pretty spectacular demo failure and Visual Studio error and a bunch of stuff like that. All right, cool. So our web application is up and running. Um, I can, I have a SQL server that is also up and running, and I can prove it this time because I have LinkPad here. And I'm connecti connecting to uh, localhost 14, uh, 1433. Uh, there is currently no databases in there other than the standard SQL server databases. And let's register with inside of our application. Uh, demo user. This is where I try and remember what the password policy that I have on this application is, because I did like 10 attempts to, log, uh, to register um, the other day. Ah, oh, sweet, there we go. Uh, okay, cool, so uh, this is talk to the SQL server. The SQL server has gone, well, you don't actually have the database ready. That's cool, I mean, your first migrations. Just gonna run those, give it a, a couple of moments. So this is, uh, the, the web server is talking to that. Uh, it's going to run the. It's going to set up the identity database within inside of that because I'm just using local identity. I'm not using anything there. Uh, I can refresh the page. Uh, actually, no, we won't. We won't log in. Whoop. Instead, I'll come back here. Like that we have created a database called Docker from scratch inside of a SQL server that's running on Docker using EFS code migrations from a web server that's running in Docker as well. So this is, I, this is now starting to look like what we might want to use as a production architecture. And you're probably not going to want to use the, SQL, uh, the default um, ASP.NET core application in production, but you get the idea. Um, I could then go through the registration process, uh, create myself an account, um, uh, password, there we go, register. There we go, I'm now logged in as a user. Um, now, if I was to stop everything and then start it all back up, that database would still have the data with inside of it so I could then re-log in because it's still that same container, it's just being shut down and restarted. If I was to remove that container and then launch the application again, I wouldn't be able to log in because I will have killed all that data. And this is where volume mounting is useful. So you'd mount all the, um, the directories that SQL Server writes its, um, its actual database files to. Um, you'd mount that as a volume, and then you would basically persist that across you know, machines or uh, whatnot. Cool. Um, oh, the, the other thing that if we just do Docker PS that we'll notice is that uh, it's been given this name, the, the SQL Server in particular has been given this name of demo app underscore SQL. Um, so like, that's given some conventions based off of the, um, yeah, the context where the, con uh, the compose file was executed. Uh, that could be a little bit annoying for how we want to connect to that database. Like what's it actually named if we want to connect to it? Well, this is where networks can become really useful. So you'll see here in the network section of the SQL database, I've said that the database that's here, the container name is going to be demo app underscore SQL because I've specified that. But the alias of that container inside of that network is called SQL. So that when I look at my app settings and I look at the database connection string here, I'm just saying SQL 1433. So I don't really care what the name of that container that's been started is. I don't even have to specify a name. I can just you know, call it um, Lovely Benz if you want to call it Lovely Benz, uh, Docker, when you first launch it. But the alias that it's going to have on the network is going to be SQL. So this is kind of like if you're doing a host name hack inside of Windows. Cool. OK, so I'm just going to kill everything. Docker stop, I don't know, Docker RM, kill with fire. 
6e588, and then we're going to docker rmi of demo app dev and docker network prune, clean up all the networks that were generated. And now I'm going to check out another demo. So like I said, the, uh, part of what we're hopefully wanting to do is we want to use networks to start segregating things and maybe it represents something that's behind a firewall that, that can't be externally accessed. Well, I mean, I don't want my SQL Server publicly accessible. I might have a super strong SA password like this, but someone might work it out. So now in the compose file, I've actually removed any port bindings. So this SQL Server is not port bound, but it still is exposing a port. It's still listening for connections on that port, and it's listening for them inside of the Docker network. So this is why my demo application, my web application, resides in its web network, publicly accessible, and the DB network, which is internally accessible. And only things that can access the database are on that network. So I'm going to launch this again. Uh, we'll wait for Visual Studio to crash, and then I'll just cry a little, and we'll clean up everything. Uh, but we'll give it a moment. There's still like a whole bunch of steps in Compose before it falls over. Hey, works first time. Uh, okay, so so this will start up, and I'm not particularly interested in the web, but that'll open up again anyway. All right, so everything's up and running. Let's jump back to Ligpad. If I was to refresh my SQL Server connection. This will ultimately time out because I didn't do port binding. As we saw in our node examples earlier, it won't connect. But I can still come here. I'm going to hit register uh, if we you know, set all the stuff in here appropriately. Oops. Uh, it'll still talk to the SQL server. I can still say apply migrations. So the website can still talk to the SQL Server, but you can't. It might be running on your machine, but you do not have access to it. That is unless you go, say, Docker uh, Network LS. So just wanted to find uh, the names of the networks. OK, so let's create an image. Uh, sorry, let's create, create a container. And we're going to join this network that's in use. So Docker run uh, remove dash network. So I'm going to jump onto that network uh, and then just use the Ubuntu and we'll jump into bash. OK, so if I was to go, oh, actually, no, not that one. So, uh, so the default Ubuntu image doesn't have ping installed. That can be a little bit of a nuisance. Uh, so I created one called ping. OK, so if I was to go ping SQL, can't do anything. If I was to um, go Docker network work, work, sorry, let's just grab that network again. I, so this time, I want to jump onto the database network. So Docker run add dash rm network is going to be that. Aaron ping bin bash. Okay, so now if I go ping SQL, there's our SQL server. So network isolation basically means that anything on that network can talk to anything else that's on that network, but it can't talk to things that aren't there. So here, because I'm on the, C on the database's network, I can talk to it. So I could, uh, if I had like the, the command line util to SQL Server, I could be using that to talk to SQL Server, but I don't have it. Uh, whereas this one here, it doesn't know about the SQL, the SQL host. It can't access it. So, and that is how we can use network isolation uh, from compose files to separate parts of our architecture out. All right, so I have one more demo that I'm just going to, let's close Visual Studio because I don't need Visual Studio open that. So I said that the, uh, the title of this talk was Docker from Scratch. I just want to talk a bit about Scratch itself. So Scratch is kind of a special concept with inside of Docker. Um, everything has to start from a base image, but the most basic base image that you start from with Docker is called Scratch. So I could create a, uh, a container, or sorry, I could create an image that then you turn into, a, run into containers from Scratch. The thing is that Scratch is really bare bones. Like it is 
about running a single process. It doesn't give you anything. It doesn't have anything inside of it. It doesn't even have bin sh, the most primitive shell in Unix. It doesn't have that. It doesn't have bash, nothing. But if you've got a process that you want to execute, you want to do it super lightweight, well, you can do that with, uh, with, um, with Scratch. So uh, the only way that you can use Scratch, I can't do Docker run and specify Scratch as an image name, because it's technically not an image name, but I can create a Docker file that says, from Scratch. Tie back to the title. Um, in this case, what I'm actually doing is I'm using Docker uh, to run a Go application. I was trying to think, what was the most simple application that I could run inside of, uh, or compile down to a native process, and that was Go. Um, I know nothing about running Go, so I copied the Hello World demo. Uh, so I'm going to run, um, I, I have, yeah, I love a little Go application. Whoops. Somewhere, I have app.go. It is really awesome. Anyone that knows how to write Go will know that that's really awesome. Uh, I'm going to use Docker Run. So I'm actually going to run a container on line 5 to run the Go compiler, because I don't have Go installed on my machine. So I'm going to run the Go compiler out of a container. Uh, it's going to generate me a binary that's going to, because it's volume mounted, right back to my Windows machine. I'm then going to create an image using my Docker file. It's going to copy that binary into the root of the container, uh, sorry, root of the image. I'm then going to run that, and then I'm going to remove it all and clean up after myself. So this is how we get, like, the idea here is we're starting to build out a, like a, a basic build process. I'm using Docker to containerize my CI CD process. I'm building an application uh, there. So uh, here is the output from Go. And then we had a whole bunch of stuff before that, which was compiling Go, building image, running container, cleaning up everything after itself. And that is how you fi finally finish with Docker from scratch. So just some like closing on, on kind of what we've covered across in this talk. Scratch is not particularly useful as an image. I uh, just like just gonna be honest, it's it's not a very useful one unless you're basically creating your own base images. So you're creating Ubuntu or Alpine or uh, uh, any other kind of general purpose OS style um, image with inside of Docker. Or you're trying to do something super high performance. Uh, particularly if you're, obviously you're compiling something down to a native process, um, then you can use Scratch, but it's not going to be useful for a lot of things. You know, uh, ASP.NET applications, you're not really going to run them out of a Scratch image. Images are really great for experimenting. Uh, running a single use process is really, uh, it's quite powerful. Like I, I can stand up something like Unra because I have no need to install WinRa for the like one time every three or four years that I need to Unra an archive on my machine. Or I can, I want to just play around with something in Go because I don't know, I don't really know how to program in Go. I don't know if I ever want to become a Go programmer, but maybe I want to just experiment, see what it's like, Basi try out the basic syntax. Well, rather than installing the Go um, build chain on my machine, I can just run it out of a container. Compose is used, and it's all about representing environments. That's what we're doing with the Docker Compose file. We start building up services with inside of that that represent the applications that we want to run and the dependencies that those applications have on each other. So we could, you know, if I have an application that needs SQL Server and a Res Redis cache, or um, it's using RabbitMQ and Mongo and a few things like that, I can I define those all as services and how I can stand them up. Um, we use this uh, client that I was working with to basically represent their dev environment because uh, they were using Rabbit and Redis and uh, Mongo and stuff like that. And uh, you'd install Redis on your first day and uh, set all that stuff up on your first day, and then six months later. Your, implement, uh, your instance had been configured completely differently to prod because you've gone in there and you know, tweaked some settings and stuff like that. Well, using the compose file, we can say, this is what the standard environment looks like, and this is how you uh, stand that up, and using all the same configs that you'd be running in you know, on a prod environment or that I'm running on my machine, and that you're running on your machine, and you're running on your machine. We're running you know, the same thing. It removes that, well, it worked on my machine. Well, how did you configure your you know, Redis cache? Everyone's running it exactly the same. I'm Aaron Powell. That was Docker from scratch. Thank you very much.